I still remember my first and possibly last competitive drone race. All seven of us were lined up at a table. We put our VR goggles on, our first person view goggles, to look at what our drone was doing. Three, two, one. We were, uh, they were off. They went through the hoops, flew through the mirror tunnel, did, uh, went through the upper, pin, the upper hoop, hair pinned down to the lower hoop. They were racing. I, on the other hand, got up, flew forwards to the hoop, hit the edge, fell upside down. Someone lifted me upside down, uh, right side up. I got up again, flew through the hoop this time, and uh, completely missed the second hoop. In fact, I even went into the judges' table. The judges had to lift me up like Simba from The Lion King as I flew off, this time making it through the mirror tunnel by scraping the edge all, all the way through. <laughs> Oh, uh, it was a race. I, uh, I hit the hoop again, this time falling right side up, got back up, flew through. <sighs> it was a mess. At one point, uh, I even almost hit myself. <laughs> uh, I only came in last when my battery died. Uh, this, I think, is what a lot of people feel when they're home cockpit building. They'll just failure after failure. It's frustrating. They uh, can't figure it out. And it's kind of funny, uh, at least I think, to see him be so bad at drones after taking so much time with flight simulation. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I would like to really make sure that uh, you're not experiencing this type of flight sim fury, if you will. <laughs> yeah, this video is quite funny. They paused it because uh, it, was, it was a mess. <laughs> so. Today I'll guide you through some home cockpit building uh, stages and tips, tricks, how to build home cockpits, how to find dimensions, uh, everything like that. We'll have three stages of planning, some of the technology you'll use for building home cockpits, um, as well as some CAD tips and some great first steps. I've been building flight simulators for five years, since I was 14. I solder, wire, design in CAD, circuit board design, um, and just generally make home cockpits. Oops. I've been working on the Cessna 172 project for three years now, and it's been really great to put all of the design energy into one plane and really build that out. I've built the Captain Bob Flight Simulation YouTube channel and website as a resource for people to get up in the air, to, so to speak, and fly the flight simulators of their dreams. First, we're gonna start, start off with the three phases of planning. I've, the first one I call scheming, like a, <laughs> and then dimensioning and detailing. Uh, so the scheming phase, I think of myself like a mad scientist with a fountain pen drawing out their monster. Uh, <laughs> I always joke about trying to fit a huge simulator in a small space. I should have uh, put the image of my simulator in my dorm. It, everything is moved off to one side, I have my simulator under the bed, um, it's kind of comical. But the first stage is scheming. So here I draw out a plan, draw it out on paper, get the rough dimensions, get it all sized, say, oh, where are we gonna put it? Uh, stuff like that, very top level. Um, a, a scheme could look like this for the new Flight Sim 2024 hot air balloon, uh, if you wanna make that a home cockpit. <laughs> but more realistically, this is what one of my schemes looked like, uh, rough drafts. So I just have an end goal, start with uh, two and three. So I have the one is the nose, I scrapped that as of now, I'm gonna add it later. Two is the panel where everything goes, and then three is the pilot's chair. Four is co-pilot, and five is like a back bench. So I just started out with two and three. <laughs> my first uh, plans, were to have, uh, so the first simulator I designed, I literally just used poster board. I laid it out on the floor, used masking tape, and figured out how big it would be. The next time I found a, a really handy guide online, I just used that to like fill everything into. And then the third one, I decided to actually use like paper, little scraps, kind of visualize it. And then I knew I was gonna use uh, CNC milled things. And so I designed this one uh, by myself. So, how do you get to the next level? 
we're always striving for the next level of precision and accuracy, and that is the dimensioning phase. Uh, this kind of bleeds through the entire process. Um, dimensions are pretty much everywhere. If you're really trying to get accurate, you don't have to get accurate. You can. Uh, that that's not for everyone, and it, it's a lot of work to get everything really accurate. So uh, I'll share some tips with how to get dimensions. So this right here is the pilot's operating handbook for the Cessna 172. This rough dimension there, 27 feet 2 inches and 8 by 10 feet right there, gives you a great full airplane scale factor if you're building a cabin. Uh, so I used this, and I knew that, oh, from here to here is that much. We'll talk more about scale factors later. The POH also gives you these fantastic weight and balance uh, points of measurement. You can see, oh, so the pilot's seat is 37 inches aft of firewall. If you know where the firewall is, you can use that as a dimension. You can also use all these handy height dimensions of the cabin width measurements. It's really incredible. You even get pretty close to the instrument panel width with uh, one of the given dimensions there of the panel width, of the uh, cockpit width. Another method is to use posters. So right here, I'm using a ruler. Uh, now I would use a caliper. These are super fancy. They get super precise measurements. And you feel like the biggest brain engineer of them all <laughs> with your little caliper. Um, <laughs> but I would take this. I would know that the scale factor of the cockpit is uh, however many min inches, 39.37. I knew that measuring the width of the panel poster was 32. 0.241 inches, so I multiplied that and got a scale factor of 1.2211. So if I measured two inches on the panel, it would be that times what that terrible number. Uh, <laughs> and so that's how you can find reasonably accurate dimensions. Another great resource is illustrated parts manuals. Um, any manuals you can find for your aircraft, and any manuals you can find for your avionics as well. So if you have like a GNS 530, you could look at the GNS 530 uh, manual, and you get a ton of dimensions there. Right here, I use the G1000 as a dimension scale factor. Um, you can see right here, I know those two dimensions. I found them online. And then I used it as a scale reference. And I found the unknown dimension of the panel. Uh, I actually had Sebastian measure the real one. And we found it was within uh, point uh, 0 0.76 percent, so it's off by like that much, which is pretty in pretty insane. Uh, I would say, like, you would have that much issue or like tolerance by cutting it manual. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, common sense is not so common, is a quote Voltaire said, and I really find common sense is a great tool. Uh, so <laughs> I'll always take every time I get a chance put my hand like near an airplane, I'll take, go to the airplane, put my hand on the airplane and take a, or near the airplane and take a picture. And then I know, oh, from my knuckle to my fingernail is this much. And I can space the rivets if I'm going that precisely or get dimensions of stuff. I also have my business card and I took a picture of it next to the turn coordinator to get the dimension of the airplane. Uh, I know the size of my business card, it's a standard business card. Oh, you can also just be like, oh, my, like this looks like it's that big. It must be around that big if you don't have any dimensions at all. Just be like, okay, I know this, but I don't know this. Let's find uh, the unknown. <coughs> so I looked through, <laughs> and another way to use this is to collect images. I actually collected 2,208 uh, images for my Cessna 172 project, images, manuals, stuff like that, measurements I took. And every time I design a component, I look at how all of the images I have of that component and try to use that. Uh, so I get some, <laughs> I'm, OK, disclaimer, I'm way in the weeds with this. You don't have to go this deep. This, like, you can, like, home cockpit building doesn't have to be this crazy. You can uh, design it all by feel or just, like, say, OK, this looks like this. I'm going to try to make it like this. I'm, go I'm, I'm way in over my head. Or like, <laughs> this is so much. Uh, so don't get overwhelmed by this. But uh, there are all of these images that I'll just use as references. 
Another great way is real aircraft. Believe it or not, if you take a real dimension, that dimension is of the aircraft, so it'll match up pretty dang well. Uh, always take a dimension with a ruler, because uh, then you have, you can say, oh, from this point to this point is 11 inches, but also from there to there, I have a scale factor, or my ruler, so I can know how high it is without even measuring uh, the height, although I would also recommend measuring the height. Uh, with, I, would re I would take a picture of this slide. It's going to be really helpful if you have any aircraft with these avionics. So G1000, these are the dimensions. Radio stack widths are almost, in general aviation, they're almost always 6.25 inches wide. So you can use that as a scale factor. Circle instruments, this one, uh, the smaller the dimension, of course, the less accuracy you're going to have. Like if you're measuring a screw as a scale factor for the entire panel, you might uh, end up with a panel like miles long. <laughs> uh, and then circle instruments, the bigger ones are usually three and an eighth inch. There are also, there are exceptions to this. And then airliners usually have the panel with, for like overhead panels and uh, um, and like pedestal panels. I believe these are usually five and three eighth inches. Um, and then they're in heights multiples of three eighths inches. Um, aircraft dimensions are usually in inches, so uh, if it if you're like this is 52.9732981 inches or millimeters, but it's like two, or it's like three inches. It's probably three inches. Um, so you can double check. I really love metric, but I'll often use inches for measuring things out because it's more accurate for airplanes usually. Um, this is actually proof that common sense dimensions work. I had like one measurement, I scaled that up, and this is how, the real one is on the left, and the one I basically guessed on is on the right. I had one dimension for the length of the, um, the flaps lever, and I used that. It wasn't even the right airplane. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Another thing, you could take a picture of this if you're really in the weeds, is mil spec. So there are all these standards of aircraft building that real aircraft builders use. Uh, for panel designs, mounting systems, um, all of the instrument bezels. So I used all of these. Um, they might not always be followed. Um, these are from like the 1950s, so um, a lot of them are even expired. But a lot of the older aircraft designs will follow these, um, and a lot of the newer ones too. Um, just take everything with a grain of salt. If it doesn't make sense, it might not be uh, following this. So you can always just double check. The devil is in the details with flight simulation building. Um, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff on my presentation too. Uh, where am I? Here I am. So you should follow a lot of stuff. Um, your cost, you should kind of think out how much do I want this to cost? Uh, how much time do I want to spend on this? Uh, you can think of a budget in terms of time as well. What computer am I going to run this on? Uh, what size will the simulator be? Um, and then if I want to DIY components or if I want to just, let's buy them. Let's see that. There are also construction materials and techniques you want to use or don't want to use. There are tools, um, everything like that. Or And really, at the end of the day, if you prefer flying, it might be more fun for you to uh, not get it perfect, get something flyable, get something really usable, um, and just get up and running, uh, like uh, put it together. You, uh, there's always compromises that you can make to make to optimize for other things. If you want it to fly, you could get it up and running really quick. If you want it cheap, you don't have to use all of the components. You can substitute components out for cheaper ones um, or different systems. Uh, so yeah. Oh, and this uh, right here is one of my plans. I m knew I wanted the simulator to get out of my door, so I made sure that each section was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was less than 24 inches wide, so it could fit through a door. Uh, that one really paid off when I moved off to college and took the simulator with me. <laughs> so, technology, you can really get overwhelmed with all the technology out there. 3D printing, woodworking, laser engraving, soldering, 
or soldering, if you're if not from the US. Um, and then uh, it's designing stuff, resin printing, uh, wood, uh, welding, metalworking, uh, CNC milling, crimping, and other electronics, uh, circuit board design. You can really get overwhelming. So I'd really recommend starting out with these four. So 3D printing is a really great skill. If you 3D print, you can make so many things. Um, and it just takes hours to, uh, after you have the design to print it out and have a really cool working piece. Woodworking is great for structures. Uh, it would take a while to 3D print an entire simulator. Uh, so you could, um, and this doesn't have to be like dovetails and lovely uh, woodworking, like fancy things. Um, if you like nail stuff together, screw it together, um, however you want to get that to work. And then soldering, if you can make strong joints, that's a great skill to have. And uh, 3D modeling, uh, the more you know how to make things in 3D modeling, the like more gears start to turn in your head and you're like, ooh, I can like solve this problem, I can make this better. And there are so many, not even for 3D, pr or for a flight simulator building, there's so many things around my house that are 3D printed. You're like, this doesn't work, I'll print a new one. <laughs> Oh, yes, great, um, great, great uh, advice. Yes, Thingiverse uh, is a wonderful tool for finding 3D prints, also printables. Um, so if you just look on printables or Thingiverse, type in flight sim or maybe even your airplane, you'll find so many models. Don't reinvent the wheel unless you're, you like being an, a wheel engineer. That's what I always say. <laughs> so how do I learn this technology? Because there's, there are literally people that spend their entire lives on just one of these. Um, probably, maybe, maybe not soldering. I don't know if anyone spends their life just doing that. That kind of seems boring. But uh, how do I learn 3D printing, CAD design, soldering, and woodworking? YouTube, 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 YouTube. Uh, there, these are, here are some great channels uh, right here. I may be saying that because I'm a YouTuber. Who knows? But uh, if you want to take a picture of this slide, uh, I also have a link in the, um, when I end this presentation, you can take a picture of that has all the slides. But th these are some great um, YouTube tutorials and tips. If you have a 3D printer that doesn't have auto bed leveling, uh, you could get a feeler gauge or like a sticky note and level it with that. Those are, that's like my favorite tip for 3D printing. Um, and so three starting tools. Uh, that I would really recommend for anyone at all ever doing home cockpit building, uh, besides 3D printers, because those are just awesome. It's like you can make even like little there are remixes online. There's like Shrek octopuses, Shrek Shrektopus, and like random things online that are hilarious. Um, you could buy it for that alone. But screwdriver, calipers, and a multimeter are some of the greatest tools for home cockpit builders. The multimeter will help you. Uh, it'll help you make sure you have connections correct. If you use the continuity set setting, the screwdriver, that's pretty obvious. And then this caliper will really let you take accurate dimensions. If you ever uh, want to test your parts um, or you want to like take dimensions of real aircraft parts. And now, <laughs> I would just like, um, I, this was the last minute. I really felt like I needed to put this in there. But things that don't exist are 100% unrealistic. Uh, I'll, if, you're, if you really like flying and you want to get up in the air and you have a simulator with nothing in it, but you're focusing on every single detail, but you really like flying and like that's your favorite part, if, you have, if you're stressing too much about the details and you never get a simulator, then I would argue that's more unrealistic than having every detail right. Um, OK. I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, <laughs> so get off, um, get your hands dirty with learning. This is one of my uh, really important that you just get out there, try things, um, watch a few YouTube videos, try stuff out for yourself, uh, and make sure that you're learning that way. There are also online resources uh, that you can really use to learn. Uh, there's MobiFlight, so much uh, MobiFlight stuff on the Discord, on their website. There's uh, other home cockpit builders, Helimech, 
Um, so Carl, Mikey's flight deck, there's uh, countless others. Uh, Google is a fantastic resource. Um, there's also ChatGPT. This is like a hot buzzword right now, but I just asked ChatGPT if um, what some things I needed to know for resin printing were, and it spit out this whole list of things I need to know. Because um, I, I was like, okay, I feel pretty confident with 3D printing. Um, I just need to know some of the things that are important with resin printing, and it gave me this whole list of stuff that I need to account for. But it is, it does have some limitations. Here I asked it if it's ethical to call my dog a hedgehog, and it said, no, that's dangerous, and that's uh, cruel to the to the dog. So I've stopped. I've stopped calling my dog a hedgehog. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> Okay, another thing is to not get discouraged. Home cockpit building can be a really long process, um, and it's easy to get be like, oh, this, this isn't working, why can't I do this? Uh, for me, I've been working on my cockpit for five years, I've, um, over the years, and I've really enjoyed doing it, learning my skills, developing, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, so, so really just like, it's not always easy, but it's, it's really cool, it's um, really awesome to build. Um, and also, templates and projects. So there are tons of projects uh, out there. These are two MobiFlight links right here in the GitHub. Uh, there's MobiFlight templates, MobiFlight panels. I put together this, a group of templates, I'll work on this more too, to get um, some more going. There's uh, also some projects, I've listed freeware and payware. Um, some great projects and resources to get started um, right here. I think everyone's done taking pictures. Um, and another great skill for learning is to just not stop that. I guess that's an, is that a skill? We'll call it a skill. Um, and here's probably maybe the highlight of my presentation. Whee! <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I stood up late doing that. <laughs> Okay, um, and speaking of learning, CAD is a great tool that's so frustrating. Uh, right here you can see all some of the CAD failures that I just thought were hilarious. Like I'll like change one thing and the model will just go poof. Oh, what? Yeah, so <laughs> sometimes you're like, why did that happen? Like what is happening? So it can be frustrating, but it can also be really fun. Uh, it's sometimes I'll just take time and uh, design stuff and it's like therapeutic once you get over all of the hurdles and are really familiar with it. One thing I really like to emphasize with my CAD is Deformata Loca and this stands for Design for Manufacturing Tender Loving Care uh, if, as if we don't have enough acronyms in our life. But I love Deformata Loca because um, just thinking about how you're always gonna design it, how you're gonna assemble it, how it's gonna go together is a really great skill uh, and thing to focus on. This flaps panel, I've seen most people do this assembly in three to four, maybe even five parts, screwing it together, stuff like that. But I used Defomato Loca uh, to make it one part that you just really have it there and it's all great there. And then just apply a decal. Right here, I have some more. Uh, deformato loca. Uh, you have these little nubs right here that align the uh, decal right here. So where this split right there is, and um, is where the decal should be aligned with these little edges. Which platform should I design on? There's SolidWorks for makers. That's ten dollars a month if you uh, want SolidWorks. Uh, there's Fusion 360, which I use. The hobby license is free. And then there's FreeCAD, which in the name is also free. This one's open source too, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, and now, on your hands, how many, you can kind of like spell it out, however you spell words with your hands. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so there are these three platforms. Um, and so with your hands, guess how many uh, actions it took to make this? Like, Okay, I did this, then this, then this, then this. Uh, so like, hold up your hands, how many actions do you think it took? Four. Yeah, to or design it. Four, five, uh, oh, that's a big number. Eight, nine, uh, eight, eight. <laughs> I'm not very good at counting. This took 
one, two, three, four, five, six actions. So I first made a sketch. Uh, then I made a extruded one triangle, extruded the other triangle, extruded the box, um, made another sketch on the other plane, um, and then just revolved that. So now, because I designed this in a way that this, it's all with sketches, and I was very careful about where my origins were and everything, if I want to make a change, say make the base half as large, it's really easy, and it's already centered, because I made sure to put the center where the center of the other sketch is. Uh, but if we do it the hard way, uh, this can take a lot more uh, steps, and it can create some issues. CAD is something you really like get a handle of for a while. So a lot of times we'll do it the hard way when we start. We'll get a box, put a hole in the box, get another box, make it a triangle, split the triangle, extrude, cylinder, cone, or make it a cone, uh, chamfer, cylinder, cylinder, more cylinders, more chamfers, more cylinders, more chamfers, more cylinders, more chamfers. And, by, and some of these even look like they have little hats on, which is kind of a fun. But this took. I'm not even going to count, um, I think 26 steps. And look at the timeline. Uh, if I wanted to go back and change something, uh, so let's make the base half as large. Since it's not centered, I made it half as large and had to move everything. So um, if you pay attention to where your origins are, then that really helps a lot with designing stuff. Um, that's a little tip. Um, you'll grow, you'll get a hand, hang, on, hang of it as you do it some more. Um, it's, it's something that comes with time, and watching experts is a really fantastic way to learn these tricks and tips. Uh, like I've watched uh, Brad Tallis do so many like designing a pencil sharpener videos, and that's really helped an incredible amount. Uh, so this one took nine times longer and has like four and a half times more steps. So that really helps um, make things quickly and uh, design easily modify them later. So I always try to fix the root cause of the problem. So I'll go back in the timeline and fix things instead of adding on another step that complicates things. Um, so I got a little in the weeds with uh, CAD. Now let's try, let's try our first steps. That is, if airplanes had feet, of course. Uh, Sebastian said the parking brake tutorial. This is a great, uh, a great first starting step. Just get a switch and a light that work with a parking brake. You can flick the switch, and you'll see the light go on and off as the, the um, simulator reads the position of the parking brake. Um, another thing is just try like your pain points. If you're like, OK, I'm flying along, and then I have to like pause the simulator, adjust this knob with my mouse, go back in. Uh, anything that you have to use the mouse for, that could be a great first project, just a single knob. Uh, something like that. My first, one of my first projects was this trim wheel. I was like, I'm, I have my uh, joystick, and I can't remember if it's the left one is up and the right one is down, or if the right side is up and the left side is down. And I, I'm not very good at configuring my joysticks, so I always like switch it. And so I was like, I just need a trim wheel. So I got a bracket, some glue, a little encoder, and that was my trim wheel for a while. Um, and there are also the Moby Flight um, and Captain Bob workshops today. There are a few slots left if you want to build a flaps module. But uh, stuff like this, and uh, you can find tutorials online for this, I believe, in the future. Uh, stuff like this, find projects on YouTube, uh, and really get building stuff. And the, just a cool thing is celebrate your wins. Uh, this is me watching Mikey's Flight Deck, another YouTuber, on my GNS 530. And I really enjoyed doing that. That was kind of satisfying. Uh, and another great tip is to reverse engineer things. Just uh, if you want to learn CAD or even if you want to like, find how things work, taking apart things, being curious, d redesigning them, that can go a really long way. Now, once you get stuck, and this uh, can happen a lot, you'll be like, why? I click the button and, and nothing happens. Or worse, something that you don't want to happen is happening. And you, you're like, when I, I, when I flick the landing light switch and, and the, the gear come up, what is happening? Uh, so 
I often get stuck, and some great tips are to uh, take time and review the problem. So uh, if you're stuck on something, make sure there's not already a solution for it. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel unless you like wheel engineering. Uh, so I, I'll draw it out, think it out, look online for solutions. Um, and I like to embrace the 15-minute struggle concept. So try it out for at least 15 minutes before you uh, go on and ask someone else. I like, be like, OK, what are the steps to fix this problem? Like, where could I see this problem being fixed? What am I missing? And once you have the 15 minutes um, all gone through, then you have a lot, of, a lot more ground to get help from other people. Be like, OK, I've tried this. This isn't working, but this is. Let me try that. So oh, another th tip is to explain it to a rubber duck or any inanimate or animate object. Um, try to explain your problem. And then sometimes you're like, ah, I figured it out. I'm missing something. Um, that's a great tip to pr solve problems. Um, and then YouTube uh, is a great resource. And then there are also Discord. And sometimes a uh, YouTube channel comments can help you out, or you can find other people with similar problems. Um, and I also, if you need to, I have Flight Simulator Consulting, and uh, I'd love to uh, chat with you about that if you're like, OK, this is just way too crazy. I, like, I, I, I should be able to give you um, either help you through it. Um, some people just like me to do it, and I'll like explain everything. Uh, but that's a resource. Um, and that's, that's it. So I, for some final tips, and you can all back. Sorry. Yeah, and this is my email. If you'd like to contact me, I would love to connect with you. Um, some final steps for e execution, not, not this type, the other type, uh, are making templates early on. Um, this is something I wish I did, because it would have made my life so much easier. Just make a template. I can copy that to the next design for each uh, decal. And I already have the right fonts, the right colors, everything great there for like designs. I can have the right like hole placements for panels, uh, something like that. Not mandatory. It might be more pain than gain, but it can be helpful if you're making a lot of similar things like instruments. I've uh, shared my templates on the template slide earlier. And if you go to the link on the next slide right here, I have a uh, I have my whole slides with all the dimensions if you missed any pictures. So uh, if you're going to take a picture, take one now. <laughs> uh, and then I have also a great practice is to have an electronics library. So a lot of models with uh, everything. Every, so you can just pull in like a switch, fit that into the model. It's uh, fantastic. So yeah, also finding a community uh, is a great tip. You can. If you can find people that are doing similar things, that's great. Okay. Oh, does anyone have any questions? Okay. So. My question is, what do I use for drawing plans out and also decals? So for drawing plans out, I use paper. Olive Garden crayons work nicely. Uh, <laughs> I also use. Yeah, as long as you have your caliper and your Olive Garden crayons, you'll be golden. Um, and a nice like rubber like mat, so you're nice in there. Um, so I use a program called. <laughs> Inkscape for all of the decals. It's open source. It deals with SVGs, so you can scale them up really nicely. Um, that's it's free, uh, so that's really something accessible. Um, I've heard of people using Illustrator um, and also Corel Draw for um, stuff like that too. Uh, any other questions? Oh yes. So the question is, do I have people um, using Blender for 3D modeling? 
Uh, it's really heavily used in the uh, virtual cockpit world, but in the home cockpit world, like physically designing stuff, uh, we find that CAD tools like computer-aided design have a lot more flexibility, like, oh, I need to make this uh, this much bigger, like I need this tolerance, I need this gap, I need to closely measure that. But I will um, usually try to use Blender for organic shapes, like if I'm designing a yoke. Uh, yes? Okay, so the online question was, what communities do I recommend? Uh, CaptainBobSim.com slash Discord is one. Uh, that's my uh, Discord community. There's the MobiFlight community uh, Discord you can find by downloading MobiFlight and clicking the Discord button. Uh, there are, there, I think there are some, I'm sure you could find some people in the Flight Sim Association Discord. Um, there's like Warthog Project Discord in the Warthog Project. Um, any YouTube channels you follow that have Discords in the link, um, those are great communities to follow. And also Facebook groups. I'm in a few. I can't name on any off the top of my head. Uh, any more questions? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> what is my biggest learning opportunity? Uh, I think I have a ton of small ones. Like, I'll design something and then I'll be like, oh, I designed it. It looks perfect. It fits awesome in the software. And then I'll print it out and it'll be like, it, it, just, it won't work at all. Uh, so, a lot of tolerances, like, I should have put up a tolerance chart, but if you want something, you should leave like uh, 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters of uh, distance between parts so that um, when you assemble things, they don't, uh, they go through nicely. They have a little play. Um, that's usually my biggest, uh, the biggest pain like problem. Oh, yes. Oh. Do you want to have a more generalized yeah, absolutely. So the question was, uh, what should we do for a more generalized cockpit, like a generic one? So for generic cockpits, you can uh, you can have a Moby Flight file that works for you can have an each aircraft profile if you want to switch between like say jets and uh, propeller planes, and then you could just uh, open up that Moby Flight file and run it from like your basic switchboard. Um, you could just like get a rectangle, drill a bunch of holes in it, um, have the different switches, get some lights, make sure, um, just find out what's most commonly used, like uh, light switches and shared components, and then just go from there. Uh, any more? Oh, oh, oh yes. So, buying individual electronic components mm -hmm. can be expensive. Yes. Yeah, uh, so some, the question was, uh, buying multiple components can be really expensive. So like, what are some component suppliers besides Amazon? Um, and some are uh, AliExpress. Those, those you can search for like 20 packs or 10 packs, and that'll usually give you a lot, um, a better deal. Always calculate it out though, um, because sometimes it'll be like 20 packs, 20 bucks, awesome, but they'll be like a 10 pack for $4 or something. Um, so, or yeah, for a, a lot cheaper. So uh, you can calculate it out easily. There's also eBay. Um, sometimes you can actually find pretty good deals on Mauser and DigiKey, and those are like very professional um, sourcing sites. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of Chinese vendors like that. All right. Uh, oh, we have another one. For frames. Uh, so usually, so the best is a difficult question. I usually use plywood. It's easy to work with. It's pretty strong. If you build it the correct way, um, you can build it so that uh, so that it's not all just bendy. If you like put things at ninety degree angles, um, you can make sure that it's a rigid frame. You can add an, leave enough gap that you have enough strength 
So I would say plywood is probably most people's best uh, choice. Uh, it's a lot better than styrofoam, <laughs> but uh, more difficult to work with than, say, metal. Uh, yes? Is there one component or system that would have been much easier and cheaper to just buy pre-made hmm. that you really enjoyed building from scratch? Something that would be cheaper to, okay, so the question was, is there something that would be cheaper to buy, but you really enjoyed building it from scratch? Uh, it, let's see. Cheaper to buy. I can't think of. Okay. Cheaper to buy, but it just, it would have been easier. Easier. Okay. Uh, I think the yoke uh, was one of those things, and the switch panel. So the yoke, I did all the designs behind it, got everything rolling, got it all linked. It, it would have been easier to just buy an off the shelf one, but I really liked building it, designing it all, um, stuff like that. And then there's also the switch panel. It would have just been easy to buy one on online, slap it in, get the right cutouts, holes, and plug it in. Uh, but I had a lot of fun uh, designing it, getting it extremely realistic, um, getting all the hole placements correct. And so I really enjoyed that. Any more questions? Um, with with that, uh, you can find me. Um, I'll be outside, but thank you so much. And stay spicy. That's <laughs>